of physical security. That's uh, of course. And um, that implies a lot of low level stuff. And I've been doing a small talk for 10 years. And I had two nicks in the last years, and finally I can use them on the same presentation. And actually, I probably dropped one of them. And I earlier dropped the first one over there, right? And uh, the talk is about security. So uh, please raise your hands quickly because we don't have enough time. So does your application need security? What do you think? Who thinks their application needs security? Okay, just oh, that's like seven. That's good. <laughs> so do you do anything for that security that you need? And uh, what about the rest that don't need security? Do you do anything? Who does anything for their security? That's good. Like, oh, one. Wow. That's <laughs> better than what I thought. So, um, we all know about the security of Java and JavaScript and Chrome and how they care about security. .NET, Flash, we've seen security advisories, but we've never, ever, ever have heard about security related to small talk. And we've never seen a security advisory for Smalltalk, and actually, very few developers in the Smalltalk community care about security. And we are very proud of Smalltalk because it's much better than Java and all the rest in most things. But in security, we may suck. But we just don't even know that. So we are lagging way behind all the other languages. Like, Years behind it. So, stop being that proud. Okay? So, I'm just going to talk about one aspect of security, and it's the lowest level of security, and it's probably the latest you must care, because there are layers way before that for an attacker to get in. But this is my expertise, and I just need one example to bring to your attention or to security, and that's what I want to do. So, what's the scenario? It's somebody running a small tech application on his box. The attacker somehow provides content to that small tech application. This is a very general scenario. And somehow, the attacker, by controlling the input, makes the application do something that's somehow unexpected. So, you can think it's kind of a hidden menu option that is not just activated with a hotkey, but with the weird bubbly format input file, for example. And in this very particular scenario I'm going to talk about, we're talking about mobile code. And pretty much you can think about compiled methods traveling from one place to another. And I'm just traveling to find examples where this can happen today in small talk. I don't have very good examples, but this is how Java works. And this is how .NET works. And this is how Flash works. And this is how... It is not how JavaScript, JavaScript works, because JavaScript transfers source code. And that's different. I'm talking about compiled methods. But it is how Google's native client, if you care about it, an amazing beast, works. So, I expect to see this happening in Smalltalk soon, maybe Today we have actually <coughs> scratch projects that are frozen uh, objects and they might contain code. We have eToys projects that might contain code. We have croquet with traveling objects that eventually will have behavior traveling from one side to the other. So we are slowly coming into the arena where this is an issue. Okay? We're talking about mobile code. So and the attack scenario is where the attacker wants to break out of the restrictions provided by the VM, be it by small to restrictions or some boxing, how it's called, like access a little bit more than what's expected. Okay? So down to real stuff. This is I'm gonna talk about 
VNMs and the Nativizer, I'm calling it Nativizer and not Compiler because we have a small-time compiler and then a native compiler, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call the later Nativizer. I don't know if the word exists, but it works. So a small talk usually works, but, oh, uh, yeah. No, I can't. So, the, the, the thing is, usually small talk code up there, if anyone wants to bring me a laser pointer or something, I, I use it. Uh, it's converted to bytecodes, and these bytecodes are not devised to assembly. Sometimes the, the bytecodes are used, only used temporary, or sometimes they are not even used. But and this is for a shift VM, a nativizing VM, not interpreted. Um, all I'm going to talk is about this kind of VMs, but there are very, very similar issues on interpreted VMs. So I'm going to talk about basically two VMs, because I only have time to see two VMs. Well, I actually saw one more, but... Thank you, James. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, uh, on this particular... the two particular VMs, which actually kind of respect uh, some very old papers... Shit, I forget the name, so, Of the people... Okay. okay. These are very old original designs. I'm talking about visual talks, visual, what, what today is called visual small talk. And this is very, very old small talk, where the small talk stack is actually the native stack. And this goes also for visual work. Does it go for Shemstone? Um, Roughly. No? Okay. It's, it's a C stack. It's, it's, not, it's not what it is. The C stack, it's okay. It's C structures, but it is not the C stack. Okay, in the stack. Uh, no. Separate area. Separate area. Okay, so it's different. It's completely different. <coughs> so, in these two inter uh, implementations, uh, the small to stack is actually the native stack. That means that when there is a push, a push in small talk to actually pass arguments to a message, that ends up being the native stack. And also, instance, instance variables are accessed directly in the sense that uh, the, there is an object pointer and its instance variables are indirectly accessed, accessed through this object pointer. Okay? This, I think, is going to be just the same everywhere because the object is somewhere in memory. Uh, I'm going to come back to this. And then, the small to context are also stored in stack. This goes... There are lots of different kinds of context. If you're following Elliot's Miranda's blog, you know what I'm talking about. I'm also talking about his VM for what I know, because I, I haven't seen it. But following his blog, I can say this applies also to his VM. And what I mean by context stored in the stack, I mean return addresses, are stored in the stack. Okay, that's the, the small, the most important thing I'm going to talk about. So if you have any question about that, go ahead, anytime. So um, this particular VM, I'm, I'm sorry to give you a little bit, but, uh, you can see here how uh, if I push a small integer, this ends up being a a small uh, an ass assembly instruction, and if I push an instance variable, this is the direct pointer, the reference. Uh, this is all Intel, assembly. But you can actually, if you can read this, you can pretty much read this. And arguments are also uh, stored in the stack, and as the as a send is translated into a call, this means the return address is going to be a in the native stack, okay? So, uh, oh, yeah. Demo time. So, um, where is it? We 
we were on a little tool that lets, lets us write bytecode on the left side and get the assembly on the right side. And we also added a few options here to the browser to see both bytecode. This is kind of old already. I took it uh, from somebody else in the Android and Valeria did it a long time ago. And now we can see also the assembly, right? So you may ask why you need this. Uh, my answer is I need it because I'm interested in assessing the security of the VM. And for that, there's no way around going back to the details. So I needed it. Um, so I can browse here and see how the assembly looks like. And actually, in VisualWorks, I found out that there is a primitive, I think it's 1001, that just returns the string of the assembly of the method. So I kind of integrated this in a menu also over there. So I have kind of the same here, assembly, so I can get it. Oh, this is my own disassembly and this is the this is, and this is a disassembly by the primitive um, that has symbolic names for register, but well that's just a detail. So I could start playing with bytecodes and seeing how they are translated to assembly. And what I'm interested, particularly, oh, that's, that's good, uh, is to see if I can, for example, manipulate the stack, the native stack, to confuse the VM and actually confuse the native process um, to return from a message sent somewhere else, not to the actual caller, but somewhere else, okay? And if I can choose where to return, I would be pretty much executing arbitrary assembly code. And let me repeat that. If I can return where I can, like, if I can make the microprocessor return to an arbitrary memory address, I can put my own program and execute it, and that be an edit program written in C, written in assembly everyone, that can do whatever, because the virtual machine is out of the game, right? I'm going to try to make my point there. Maybe. So I, try, I started playing with different all codes over here. This is not the actual process I followed, but this is really nice. So. Yeah, I went through a twisted path. So I added a push, and it's a push. And I can push a small integer, whatever I want, and it pushes it. Okay. I can actually pop and pop more. I can actually drop from the top of the stack, I think this is interaction of like five things, and drop things from the stack. And I'm just manipulating the native stack. And on the other side, I'm also writing assembly language programs with bytes. okay? And the same kind of goes with different translations for Visual works, and eventually the same goes for every small talk with the night device in VM. So you can somehow treat bytecodes as macros in, small, in assembly, right? And, and so here it goes. If there was a bug in the night device, so maybe I can confuse it and make it write an improper assembly language, improper opcodes. And so there is going to be an incompatibility between what the NAT advisor wants to do and what the microprocessor understands. And that's very interesting for an attacker. Okay? So I'm going very quickly. But so ask me questions anytime. Whenever you want to ask me anything, just go ahead, raise your hand. Do some exercises, fight on CU, start shopping, whatever. 
So, how do we break out of the VM? Can we break out of the VM? So, who's following? <laughs> oh, that's very, very good. That's great. So, my first attempt was to just push something and return. Why? Because when you return in assembly, the, the microprocessor just takes what's at the top of the stack, whatever it is, and shunts to it. It's a shunt. It's shunting somewhere else. That's what returning means. So if I can push something into the top of the stack and return, I'm going to shunt there. Just, that's what it means. So, but there are a few details here because before, if you, if you see the, the assembly here, before returning, it here restores the stack pointer. So, yes, I'm pushing the top, on the top of the stack, but before returning, it arbitrarily moves the stack pointer out of the way of what I, what I pushed. So what I push is going to be the hand hanging out of nothing. But, if we, in this particular VM, if we declare this method as a leaf method, like, the method does not call anything, this VM does some optimizing, because it does not really need to save anything. So, actually the bytecode is called no frame prologue, and the prologue of the function is actually saved in what you need to restore when you go out. So if we put the bytecode no frame prologue, we end up with a very small native method without a prologue, and what's much more important for our objectives, without an ep epilogue. I don't know how to pronounce the word, but you get it. So, here, if we watch the assembly, it's going to be shunting somewhere to this number, right? It's going to be shunting to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, is it? So, let's see. Um, I want to shunt to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And um, I mix all the cookies. And uh, the, the small integer representation shifts it. So I have to shift it the other way. Um, so let's come here. Okay, so we got it. Um, I don't know if it's going to work. No, I'll do it. It's not good. Let's, let's do it.
Oh no, it's not that. It's not a security check. I mean, actually, I, I have check. I have some somewhere. So, okay. So let's try to to save this. And, and I I could restart, but I actually don't want to do it. So if I now point the
they should slowly come back. <laughs>
We also get a debugger here. And if we see, we got pop, 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 red, and that's actually over here, that's the game breakpoint, pop, 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 and this is another pop, red, okay? So I'm again executing arbitrary native code, and if we continue, it keeps working. So... Yes, we broke out of the VM. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the VM is a little bit different in Synco. I found out that you cannot arbitrarily push things in the stack because it waits until it, sends, it sees a send of code to know what, how many arguments it has to push. But eventually we broke up. So now let's go back a little bit to this. The idea is that in this particular attack that I'm interested in, the attacker transfers the compile method and activates it. And then the attacker scans the VM and accesses the OS. And no, it's not the responsibility of the OS to provide application storage isolation. Yes, the OS does provide user-to-user -user isolation, but it does not provide isolation from my small top application to what's stored in the browser's, web browser's cache, because it's the same user. So if the attacker can break out of the VM, it, he's going to be able to access all the files in the file system and quite likely escalate to the, through a privileged escalation back of the OS to root or administrator. So, yeah, the attacker gets all the fun. So how do we go about solving this? I don't really know, but let's try a few things. Reachability. Reachability in the sense of namespaces, like uh, if I can't access the bytecode array of the compiled method, I won't be able to change it. But if we are transferring frozen objects, mm. there is not much there. I mean, the serialization has also to check all that. But again, in a very dynamic language, reachability only implemented in a language is very hard to achieve. Like, inside the language, if it's dynamic as a font, I think it's not possible to implement very security reachability. I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't think reachability from the language is an option. So, let's go down a little bit to the VM. And um, we call that sandboxing. You can implement reachability in the VM, but to do that, you have to add checks everywhere. Maybe when the... How does Java and .NET does it? I'm not going to go deep into that, but let's say there is a current user with its privileges, and every method, and maybe every instance variable, is... How do you say it? Decorated with the privileges needed to access and call the method or access the instance variable. So every time there is an activation, the permissions are checked. All this is written down in some books. And I, I could help you find them if you are interested. I think they are written in some books. But we also need some boxing at the OS level, but because maybe the application does need to access the file object. So we also need to have isolation on the primitive layer, okay? So we may need to check all the parameters of the primitives, maybe. And if it's a VM that not devices, we also need to check something there, because it's obvious, I, I hope now, that by controlling the bytecode, I can escape the VM. So, this is common, and if it's an interpreter, maybe 
you can also escape the VM because if the interpreter just does a push when it's a push, then a push is a push. So. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so that, this is called verifier. And in the examples I've shown, for example, the Nazi visor has to verify that the RET of the message of the selector is the same as the, as the number of arguments declared by the compile method. That's validation or verification. And other things, that the stack is not unbalanced. And you can do that checks when you're not devising. You don't need to do them on runtime. There are some that you may need to do on runtime, but most of them you can do when you're not devising. So, is there other ways to escape the VM? <laughs> yes, there are other ways to escape the VM. Uh, what happens if, in a small integer, I declare this method? The small integers do not have instance variables. Yes. Now? <laughs> it says in minutes. Okay. So, in short, what's going to happen is that the small integer is going to be taken as the object pointer and the first instance variable is going to be used and that means just access the memory. And I, I was going to show it, but I'm not. So, well, what I was going to show is if, if I do this and I come here to the debugger and we see what's going on, we see that it's trying to access that memory, but I'm not going to show it. So, um, I did show it, if you didn't see it. <laughs> so, let's jump back to the presentation, because I want to talk about something else. Uh, so, the same thing goes for visual works, VM. I'm not going to put questions here. So, we need to cross to the other side, okay? We need to start caring about security because we've heard small talk is slow, small talk is ugly, small talk is whatever, and we're gonna start hearing small talk is unsecured, and we're just gonna have to say, well, but it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> So we went through 
every biker <coughs> and dog humanity. Okay? And for every biker you can see how it's implemented. Uh, we we coded a bunch of a few tests to test every possible combination of uh, bytecodes and arguments and what this is doing is nativizing with the original nativizer and with our nativizer and comparing the byte the assembly five minutes? Oh, okay, five. Seven minutes? <laughs> okay so well this is sad uh, because you're gonna lose the better thing and it's, this nativizer actually works and we, if you have questions, just shoot me. I, I actually have a question. Sure. Yeah, so, uh, Michael from Syncom here. Um, one of the things that I find interesting about this is you can gain the bytecodes to create some kinds of assembler that allow you to escape out and run other code. But if you want to actually make an attack that's going to be useful to you on that machine, you need a more sophisticated program that you're going to jump to. The assembly? Right. I've been doing that for 15 years. I swear it's possible to do everything. Well, my, my point being is that when the memory, apart from the jitted memory, is marked as not executable, then the only assembly you can install in that, product in that machine is going to be through the bytecodes. You're not going to have enough instructions to really pull off a, a real yeah. attack. Well, yes. Well, he's asking, on modern operating systems, most data is mapped as non-executable. Okay? There are ways around that. I mean, we, in, in the company I work for, we commercialize tools that do that. So it's commercially possible to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of what I want you to say, yeah. yeah you know, beyond, beyond even these attacks, uh, Storm Talk is very insecure. Uh, even in VisualWorks, you can just make an external method and give it a pointer to any address you want. Absolutely. Want. So you don't even have to get the bytecode. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Like FF5, if you don't do any checks, that's pretty much a big hole. You don't need all that. I just wanted to get your attention. Um, just another question. How, how long did it take you to learn all these things and now you are the expert hacker for a visual small talk enterprise system which might not be available on all the machines around the world? You asked me two questions. You only said one, but... <laughs> I'm gonna first ask the one you didn't ask. Who is it? How long did it take for me to break out of the VM and execute native code? Two days. Two days. I mean, two days. <laughs> How long did it take for me to learn all this? It took me a year. But this is much more than breaking out of the VM. And that's a very good question. When an attacker goes and tries to uh, gain access to a, co to a computer, he just uh, has not, doesn't need to know everything about it. The, 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 the way to go is... Who's interested? Come later and I'll show you something very interesting. That's true. And what 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 attacker does is first finds an error, and the error is usually a warning for something working wrong, something that's not expected. And then the attacker just learns what's necessary to exploit the error and take it to something to profit from it. And that took me two days. Uh, like I've been doing it for a long time, okay? But it took me two days. Any other questions?